the Bioinformatics Computational Biology Lab. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Carl Hornlow. Um, he's an evolutionary biologist from the University of Idaho. Uh, Dr. Romo obtained his PhD from the University of Washington, and then he has a postdoc from Oregon State, uh, working with Dr. Stephen Arnold on some key uh, questions in the field of evolution and genetics. Since then, he's branched out into the field of population genetics and some conservation genomics. And uh, a lot of his recent seminal works have involved the use of a novel method called glass pack sequencing technology, uh, about which you'll probably hear about today, and especially in large scale marker discovery for non model uh, organisms. Uh, we're really happy to have you here, and it's really nice to interact with him and uh, have him talk to a lot of grad students and faculty here. Uh, with that, Dr. Hong. Okay, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here, and, and it's a special privilege to be invited by gradu graduate students. That's great. Um, so I've enjoyed talking with a lot of you today. So thank you. So I'm going to talk about quite a bit in this talk, so I'll, hopefully I won't go too fast for you all, but I'll rush through a few things. Here's the basic outline of what I'll talk about. Uh, I'll talk about the general field of population genomics and how, what I think that term means. I'll talk about RAD sequencing and how it fits into the general scheme of genomic tools. Talk about a couple applications and the important difference of whether or not you have a reference genome sequence to use when you're doing population genomic studies. And then a few lessons that might be learned from all of the, the work that I've been connected with in some way. Okay, so what is population genomics? Essentially, I think of it as the application of genomic techniques in natural populations, which is a pretty straightforward definition. So what does that mean? The first thing it means is that we have lots more markers, so lots more genomic markers, genetic markers across the genome. So just as an example, here's a, uh, the introductory paper to a special issue that came out pretty recently. Uh, most of the papers in this special issue were focused on fisheries, genetics, but all kinds of other sorts of things identifying SNPs in various sorts of organisms. And if you look at this table down here, you go through some traditional techniques like Sanger sequencing, then you get to the genomic techniques. Our number here is pretty puny, but look at this one, half a million SNPs identified using genomic techniques. So, so these genomic techniques give you orders of magnitude more markers than we're used to in traditional population genetics. But I would argue there's a more fundamental difference in population genomics compared to population genetics, what I think of as a genomic perspective. So in traditional population genetics, we're used to thinking about alleles at loci grouped within, say, within indi diploid individuals, grouped within populations, and across those alleles at, the, at that locus, we can identify, calculate population genetic statistics, things like FST, population differentiation. And those are single point estimates of those statistics. In a genomic world, now we have haplotypes across the genome for multiple individuals and populations. And these things that used to be single numbers are now continuous distributions along the axis of the genome. So all of these traditional population genetic statistics, even things like effective population size, are continuously distri distributed variables along the genome, and even things like coalescent structure across haplotypes. We can also take this sort of distribution and think about mashing it down on this axis and get just a frequency distribution across the genome. So a lot of what people do with population genomic studies is just identify loci that are outliers in this sort of genome-wide distribution. And I'll come back to this, this genomic perspective toward the end. Okay, so in this context, one thing that I think about a lot is the genomic architecture of phenotypic traits. And in this, in the population genomic context, genomic architecture includes a bunch of things, like the distribution across the genome of adaptive genetic variation, correlations among genomic regions, things like linkage disequilibrium, and interactions in the form of, for instance, epistasis. We also have genomic structural things like chromosomal inversions, and all of these together add up to, to produce the independent axes of phenotypic variation in natural populations along which evolution can move. So the genomic architecture of phenotypes 
as a result of, of all these factors lead to the essentially the, the multivariate space of phenotypes that evolution can act in. Okay, so I'll talk about RAD sequencing and how it fits into the context of population genomic tools. So we can kind of split up genomic techniques into a few large categories. The first is whole genome sequencing. And a lot of people have talked about the, f the future, potentially the near future of population genomics being that you'd go out into a natural population and sequence the whole genome of multiple individuals from multiple populations, get complete genetic information. And that's becoming more and more feasible. The question is whether that overkill of data will end up killing you on the bioinformatics side and being more hassle than it's worth. So I would say that some of the re reduced representation approaches will still be useful even if it's feasible and not overly expensive to get whole genomes. So there are a couple ways to reduce the representation of the genome. One of them is targeted sequencing. You can target, say, the transcriptome. You can target any regions of the genome just by using probes and a technique called exon capture. But then there is a whole family of anonymous genomic sequencing techniques. And RAD sequencing is one of those. So I'll just go through the basic idea of, of how RAD sequencing works. And then the data that you'll see are, are produced by that technique. So the basic idea is that we take genomic DNA from here, in this case, three diploid individuals. We digest it with a restriction enzyme. And these triangles represent the restriction enzyme cut sites. We ligate an adapter onto those cut sites. And each adapter includes a barcode unique to each individual. So now we can identify these individuals from the sequence data at the end. We pool, pool across individuals, shear the DNA, amplify those fragments that have the adapter, so only the fragments that are adjacent to those restriction enzyme sites, and then sequence on an Illumina high-throughput sequencer. And so the re resulting data that we get across individuals is short sequence reads adjacent to restriction enzyme cut sites across the whole genome. But there are a few things to remember about this approach. And in fact, these, these considerations apply to, to most genomic approaches. So we're taking DNA from multiple individuals, potentially multiple populations, multiple sites across the genome, pooling it all together and throwing it into this machine. And that means the whole thing is a big multi-level sampling process. So from a bioinformatics point of view, it's important to keep all of those levels of the sampling process in mind. So we're sampling across tags, across loci, sampling across alleles. We're dealing with things like sequencing error, amplification bias, all sorts of sources of variance. So one thing that we've done to, to account for some of these sources of variance is to use a maximum likelihood model to call genotypes at each nucleotide position based on the, the counts of reads that are observed from the RADSeq data. So if you like equations, you can focus on this. I won't get into it too much. It's essentially just a, a multinomial sampling model. Okay, so I'll get into a couple of the applications and, and touch on a few more of the sorts of bioinformatic and computational considerations as I go. First, I'll talk about the case where we have a reference genome against which to align the sequence data, because it makes it simpler in a lot of ways. And I'll talk about it in the context of the three-spine stickleback, which is a model system for evolution. So if we have a reference genome sequence, we can take all the reads that we get from RAD sequencing data and align them against that reference. And from there, we can call SNP genotypes calculate whatever summary statistic we're interested in. We can use things like a sliding window average to turn all of this data into a continuous distribution, just like I showed you at the beginning. So we can directly estimate this sort of population genomic distribution. And we can even do things like put p-values on the significance of outlier regions, whether they're low or high, based on in, in the data that I'll show you, it's based on bootstrap resampling. You could come up with other schemes as well. 
OK, so the three-spine stickleback has become a real model for evolutionary biology. In large part because it has a marine ancestor found around the northern hemisphere that has repeatedly colonized freshwater habitats, lake and stream freshwater habitats. And each time it does that, these freshwater populations tend to show a lot of the same phenotypic traits. So those phenotypic traits in freshwater have evolved in parallel over and over again. So it's essentially a replicated evolutionary experiment. So I'll focus in on a few populations up here in Alaska, south central Alaska. I'm going to talk about two marine populations here and here and three freshwater populations up here. And for a few reasons that I won't get into, even though they look close together, this is Alaska and it's a big place, but we also have good reason to believe that these three freshwater populations represent separate independent colonization events from freshwater. OK, so first just scanning across the genome, comparing each of those freshwater populations, these three freshwater populations, against the oceanic ancestor. So if we just scan across the genome, comparing each freshwater population to the ancestor, you can see the gray and white shading here represent the chromosomes. You can see incredible parallelism across the three populations in which regions of the genome are highly differentiated from the ancestor. So in other words, not only is there parallel phenotypic evolution, but there's parallel genetic evolution across the genome in terms of which regions of the genome are responding to selection. OK, here's another piece of the story. In Alaska, there was an, a huge earthquake in 1964. This is downtown Anchorage. Uh, that's you know, one half of the street, the other half of the street. What that one thing that earthquake did was uplift large areas of land, including Middleton Island, which is out here about 100 kilometers away from the mainland out in the Gulf of Alaska. So here's an aerial photo of Middleton Island. The island ends right about there, so it's pretty, pretty small. But you can see all these wave platforms. Essentially, all of this area was under the ocean before 1964. It was uplifted on the order of 10 to 12 meters. So it's a, a huge event, but you can see all these little ponds out in these wave platforms are new freshwater habitat that was created in 1964. And those freshwater habitats have been colonized by stickleback. So we can exactly date the maximum age of those populations. Some colleagues at the University of Alaska have gone out there. You have to take a helicopter out to the island, collected stickleback. And if we do the same genome scan as we did before, comparing freshwater versus oceanic stickleback on Middleton Island. This is the data that you saw before. This is Middleton Island. You can see essentially the same genomic regions are popping up as being highly differentiated from the marine ancestor. There's some variation in, in how extreme or how significant they are, but for the most part, the genome has evolved in parallel on the scale of decades in these freshwater populations. So one more piece of the puzzle that I'll talk about. One hypothesis is that when we have multiple freshwater loci, multiple regions along the genome that are involved in adaptation to freshwater, we can ask whether they're maintained as a gene complex, maintained in association with each other through linkage disequilibrium. So for this, I'll just focus on these two oceanic populations that I talked about before. Essentially, these are, are not differentiated from each other, so the data that I'm going to show lump those two together. It turns out this is comparing across two chromosomes, between two chromosomes. So chromosomes in stickleback are still called linkage groups for some reason. So this is linkage group four and linkage group seven. These graphs here show the, the FST between marine and freshwater. So you can see the significant peaks that we identified before. And if you look, there's evidence of linkage disequilibrium between these chromosomes linking together genomic loci that are involved in adaptation to freshwater. So this is between chromosomes, which is highly unexpected because there's free recombination. So something is maintaining 
what looks like pretty strong linkage disequilibrium. Not across all pairs of, of freshwater loci, but across some of them. Okay, so taken all together, what, is, what does all this information mean? So, the traditional model for stickleback and the way in which it's, it's been thought of as an evolutionary model system is that we have this large, old, well mixed oceanic population across the northern hemisphere. That it gives rise repeatedly to small freshwater populations that undergo divergent selection, strong selection. But that there's a minimal effect of gene flow from the freshwater back into the ocean. And so the prediction from this traditional model would, that would be that you'd see signatures of divergent selection in freshwater, but essentially nothing in the ocean. No signature of this divergent selection in the ocean population. But that's not actually what we saw. So to fit our data into a new context, here's sort of our new working model for the stickleback system. So first, effective population size is, is comparable between the ocean and the aggregate of all freshwater populations. There's gene flow from the freshwater back into the ocean that maintains freshwater adapted alleles in the ocean. And Dolph Schluter proposed this hypothesis a couple years ago. He called it the transporter hypothesis or the transporter room hypothesis after the transporter room in Star Trek where you know, someone could be atomized down on the planet, beamed up to the ship, and reformed. The idea is that you have freshwater, multi-allele, multi-loci freshwater adapted phenotypes that get atomized out in the ocean population and then reassembled into a new freshwater population. The problem is it's hard to find a mechanism for this sort of model. But what it looks like from our data is that LD provides, linkage disequilibrium provides part of the mechanism. So the metapopulation dynamics, the gene flow back and forth is enough to maintain linkage disequilibrium among freshwater adapted alleles, even in the ocean. And so that genomic architecture, those relationships, associations across the genome are sufficient to facilitate rapid parallel evolution in newly colonized freshwater habitats. And probably we have good reason to expect that things like chromosomal inversions and strong epistatic selection are also contributing, highly contributing to the maintenance of this genomic architecture of, of freshwater adaptation. Okay, so just to get back to this um, sort of population genetic, genomic perspective. There's one sort of outstanding question that I, that I want to pose here. So this is some of the data that I just showed you. This is actually just one part of linkage group four. This is FST between one of the freshwater populations and one of the oceanic populations. And one gene that's been, that I haven't mentioned before, this is sort of the, the textbook stickleback gene called EDA, which controls part of the skeletal structure that evolves in parallel in freshwater populations. It's located right here, so we're probably seeing the signature of selection on that gene. But you can see this pattern of differentiation looks like a, like a big mountain range. So if you go out into natural populations and see this pattern of differentiation, how many people would say across this region there's one gene under selection? Anyone? How about two? Four? Eight? Write in votes? Essentially, I think there's, there's not a good reason for consensus on what this number actually is. Part of the reason is it depends how you analyze the data. So this is, this is a, a sliding window averaging plot. If you make your window size smaller, the mountain range looks like this. This is the exact same data, the exact same genomic region, just with the window size smaller. And as you, I don't know if you can see all those lines, but 
the basic idea, if you make the windows bigger, it smooths out this curve and you end up with what looks like fewer loci under selection. Now just go to the raw data. Here are just individual SNPs. So this is FST at all the individual SNPs across this region. If you didn't have a reference genome, you would establish some, say, some significance threshold and now look at how many loci are under selection. So you'd pull all of these loci out of your list of SNPs as being putatively under selection. Okay, so that brings me to the next part of what I'm going to talk about. What can you actually say when you don't have a reference genome? So as I said, this is sort of the population genomic perspective where we can think of these population genetic statistics as continuously distributed across the genome. But if you don't have a reference genome or any way to physically place all of those markers, essentially you're left with this, this kind of distribution. But you can still say a lot about what's going on in your populations. Okay, so one really important consideration that I want to talk about in the absence of a reference genome, and this is one of the central challenges for data analysis, bioinformatics on this, sorts of, this sort of data, if you have loci that have duplicate sequence, say over here and over here, if you don't have a reference genome against which to align your data and you try to assemble them together, chances are the duplicate sequence will assemble all into one big stack. And if there's, say, one nucleotide difference between this one over here and this one over here, they'll all assemble together and that, those duplicate regions are almost impossible to distinguish from two alleles at a single locus. So that's the central, one of the central problems in, in analyzing this sort of data without a reference genome. Here's one way you can deal with it. So this is a study that I did with collaborators looking at uh, two trout species. We were interested in just identifying SNPs for studying hybridization between two species. So what we were interested in was a relatively small set of high confidence SNPs. So we did one lane of rad sequencing. You can see we got almost 100,000 putative loci, what appeared to be loci. But then we went through some pretty heavy filtering in order to deal with that paralog problem that I just mentioned. So one of the things that we filtered for was observed heterozygosity. So the basic idea is that if you scan across individuals and every individual looks like a heterozygote for this same what appears to be a SNP, chances are that that's actually two loci with a, a nucleotide difference that are assembling together in your data. So that's what we did. We identified loci that, that looked like a heterozygote in nearly every individual and pulled those out in a couple different ways. And so you go from 100,000 putative loci down to about 9,000 candidate SNP markers that we can have much higher confidence in that they're actual true loci and actual true SNP alleles. Okay, so here's another sort of outstanding question in population genomics that I think is important. <coughs> if you don't have a reference genome sequence, you can produce this sort of distribution. So this is actual data again. This is, this is the same stickleback data that you saw earlier. If we just take all of the SNPs and plot them as a frequency histogram for FST, you can see we have a huge number of markers and we get this distribution. But the thing about having this huge number of markers is that we can get potentially a really, really precise estimate of the shape of this distribution. So this inset is just the, the tail of the distribution scaled up so that you can see it in more detail. But if we have 40,000 markers, we can get a really precise estimate of this distribution. And the question is, what can we tell from that just the shape of that distribution. Can we say anything about, say, the strength of selection, the number of different loci under selection, migration rates, population size, 
is this situation in, in equilibrium or is it in some transient state? People have proposed sort of verbal hypotheses for some of these based on the shape of this distribution, but we don't have any sort of quantification of what we can infer from this sort of distribution in the absence of a reference genome. Okay, so now I'll talk about just a few sort of basic lessons and, and best practices in population genomics experiments. So first, as I mentioned earlier, RAD sequencing and most of these genomic techniques are multi-level sampling processes. But not only are they a multi-level sampling process, they have higher variance than we would expect even if we account for all the, the sources of variance that we think we know about. So for instance, here's a plot showing distribution of reads per RAD tag. In other words, sequencing depth of coverage across loci, across the genome for a set of individuals. So you can see different individuals had different average coverage. This one has a lot more than, this green one has a lot more than this blue one overall, so the curves are shifted. But if you just expect a naive Poisson process, which is what you would expect if you're, if you have, say, a sock drawer with, with 50,000 different socks and you're just pulling at random with replacement, you would expect this kind of distribution. But in fact, we observe this sort of distribution. In other words, the variance in sequencing coverage is much, much greater than we would expect. And we can take into account other sources of variance too, and we still are left with, with unexplained variance in depth of coverage across loci. So that's a really important consideration in, in analyzing this sort of data. Okay, the second lesson, in part because of this first one, <coughs> is don't lowball your sequencing coverage. In other words, I've heard of a, a lot of people who are designing these experiments uh, using RAD or other techniques and they think, oh, we can, you know, we can do 4X coverage or something like that and, and estimate diploid genotypes. But if your coverage is too low, this is mean coverage, you can end up with essentially useless data and a, and a waste of money. In other words, to account for this elevated variance, you have to set your mean coverage relatively high in order to get good genotypes at a large set of markers across individuals. Okay, another uh, soapbox opinion. I would say it's a bad idea to pool individuals in marker discovery especially if you don't have a reference genome. Even if you do, I would say this is the case. So in other words, if you're interested in identifying, say, SNP markers in a population, it's a bad idea to pool individuals together and, and sequence them all together without barcoding them individually. So there's some theoretical work that suggests that pooling is better at estimating population level allele frequencies. But that theory is based on the assumption that you know exactly which loci all of your reads came from. So you can unambiguously assign your sequence reads to different loci across the genome. But if you can't do that, then your, your data is going to be a mess. Essentially for the reason that I talked about where paralogous duplicate sequence tends to assemble together and make it look like you have a nice locus with a allele frequency of 0.5. So it's best to barcode by individual so that you can do all of those sorts of screening approaches that I talked about. So that leads to the last point that if you calibrate your sequencing coverage and your number of individuals and your choice of genomic technique to get lots and lots of markers then you can afford to do the sorts of conservative filtering that will leave you with high confidence data at the end. So you saw with the trout example, we went from 100,000 putative markers down to less than 10,000 good candidates. Since that study, we've done further validation, which has chopped that number down even more. 
we're still left with several thousand good SNP markers, but that's because we started with so many more and we're able to be conservative in, in filtering out the bad data. Okay, so I want to thank my collaborators at basically every part of the Pacific Northwest, and I'll take any questions. Thanks. Fred. Uh huh. Yeah, you noticed that. Um, <laughs> so it it really varies depending on what sorts of genomic resources you have available, whether you have a reference genome, how nasty your genome is. Um, so in in Stickleback, we have a reference genome. We aim for somewhere around 15 to 20x. So that's for estimating diploid genotypes in an outbred population. If you don't have a reference genome or if your genome is full of duplicate sequence and stuff like that, getting up towards 50x or even more is a good idea. Um, there's a company called Florigenics that does rad sequencing as a service for lots and lots of people and they like to guarantee their quality of data so they go for 150x or something like that. In other words, it's a lot more than you would expect. But keep in mind that that's the mean expected coverage and with such huge variance around that, you know, some loci are going to be much lower, some are going to be much higher. So in order to get the same set of loci across individuals, you have to have your mean that high because some will drop out for each individual. Well, so I should have probably mentioned one other application that a lot of people have applied RAD sequencing for is making a genetic map. And so in, in taxa, without any sort of genomic resources, you can do a uh, cross, get offspring, genotype them at, this, at RAD tags. And there have been a few genetic maps that have been published in the past year or two with, you know, on the order of 20,000 or 30,000 markers. So it's an incredibly dense genetic map. The cool thing about that is that you get so many markers, you can do an F1 map instead of an F2 map because I get confused with the details myself. But um, essentially, you can use markers that are AA in one parent and AB in the other parent, get all the F1 offspring and create a genetic map from that. And that means you don't even have to be able to breed your critter in the lab. You can potentially go out, and if you can find parents and a clutch of offspring, you could, and if it's enough offspring, you can, you can build a, de a dense genetic map from that. Right. Right. So that's a that's a good point. And I think I mentioned at the beginning the idea of whole genome sequencing that people talk about the future being you'll just go sequence the whole genome of all your individuals. I think the future is likely to be if you're going into a new organism on a three year grant or whatever, the first year we'll be getting a whole genome sequence as a reference. And maybe like you're saying, maybe it's lots of contigs, maybe you haven't fully assembled all the chromosomes, but just as a backbone reference. And then you go and do all your high throughput individuals and you have that as a backbone. It is. Um, I think my point was that in, in population genetics, people think of loci as discrete things. But in reality, a genome is a, a continuous distribution of loci. Um, so that it, 
it leads you to think a little bit differently in terms of, of distribution across the genome when you're not talking about just discrete loci and recombination rates between them, but this sort of continuous stretch of information. It's sort of a philosophical difference. And I, and I mean, population genomics is essentially population genetics in the modern age, I guess. Well, it's, it's continuous to the extent that, that what matters is the effective recombination rate. So it's the, you know, the recombination rate times effective population size or an across times the number of offspring you have integrated over the history of the population. So if you have a really old panmictic population that's been, say, without any selection, all of those recombination events add up to, you know, eroding LD across the genome and, and making those markers independent. If you have a situation of. So I guess you're not, I'm, I guess I'm thinking of the across, so you're thinking more of a population versus just historical species. Although it's, it's just accumulating all these trace points. Yeah. But even in across, if you have, you know, if you have enough individuals, Maybe there's one recombination per chromosome per individual, but with lots of individuals, you can still piece out all those recombination events. The, the main thing I was getting at was that if you, don't, if you don't have existing genomic information, like a reference genome, if you pool individuals, there's no way to distinguish um, two paralogs from a single locus with two alleles at frequency of 0.5. There might be others. <laughs> like I said, if, if you know exactly where your reads came from, the sampling theory suggests that pooling lots of individuals is actually better at estimating population level allele frequency. But that depends on you correctly assigning all your reads to different loci. So I was just wondering whether you extract technologies to using one place um, I know that people have done it. You, you get into this problem of paralogs align, assembling on, on top of each other. Um, I'm trying to think. I haven't, I've just sort of heard about people doing it, and I haven't heard about all of the statistical machinations that they're going through to account for it. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly could be used. You just need to do lots of sequencing and lots of analysis. It's just a function of where the restriction enzyme okay. cuts. Right. Right. So you can calibrate your expected number of markers across the genome by how frequently the restriction enzyme cuts. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. So one thing that people have, have used RAD for is to build a genetic, genetic map as the scaffold for a whole genome sequence. Um, so if you can now get really easily, you know, many KB of sequence, uh, you could 
hang those on a genetic map, say from red, to assemble a whole genome? Maybe you wouldn't even need a genetic map. That's a good question. I don't know if those new technologies might make all these things obsolete or not. But people are still doing microsatellites in some cases, so we'll see. So that's a really good point. Um, essentially, you cannot get sequencing coverage high enough so that you won't have missing data. And that's, as you say, that's inherent in this kind of data. So at, at some level, every individual will be genotyped at a different set of markers. And every set of markers, every marker will have a different set of individuals genotyped there. Um, and it's just something that you have to account for. It can be done statistically in whatever analysis you're doing, but you have to keep that in mind. It's not possible to sort of filter down to the set of markers that are genotyped across all individuals, because that ends up throwing out too much data. So do you suggest that doing the interpretation or do not do doing the interpretation? You could. I've done that a little bit. Um, I don't know. It probably depends on what you're what you're trying to do, whether that's a good idea or not. The risk is that you, you impute missing genotypes, and then if you take those as given and do the next statistical step that you're giving yourself some measure of false confidence. Um, yeah, I think it depends on the application. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot. Sean. All right. Um, thanks.